Benvenuti a tutti, benvenuti qui a Palazzo Vivaldi. Welcome Vivaldi, to everybody. Da, welcome to Palazzo, Palazzo Vivaldi. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the President and of the Board as well. Now we are here in front of this monumental complex that is a very, very great value from a historical point of view for many Many years it was uh, used by high prelates. It is important also for its position because it is right above the Fori Imperiali, the Massenzio Basilica. Now this complex is of a very, very high value as you will see in, in the past the century. Uh, however, unfortunately, it was not open to the public in the 70s, uh, political uh, groups uh, uh, created their headquarters here uh, with uh, cultural activities that were held here in this building, uh, and thus it became very important for a political and cultural reason in those years. Then it was abandoned, and only recently, thanks uh, to a well-established relationship between ISMI and uh, the MIBAC, we were able to actually start some projects to actually promote this uh, Palace uh, Vivaldi. Together with uh, MIBAC, uh, we created uh, four work sites that were held uh, in all areas of the complex that uh, involved both uh, woodworks but also structural parts of the building itself. Now, during the COVID pandemics, unfortunately, we were not able to uh, actually continue with uh, our projects when 100%. However, with the ministry, we uh, decided to continue with our work sites. And of course, uh, the Lazio region was instrumental in all of this because they too gave us a helping hand and uh, helped us to uh, involve all institutional players. So we hope that we will continue this relationship with the ministry to promote this uh, complex that is truly unique in this genre, that it is uh, undoubtedly a very, very great value. That said, I'd like to invite you all to come in and to see with your own eyes the beauties that we hold inside. I am with uh, Maria Adelaide Ricciarder, Ricciardi, uh, General Direction of Education, Research uh, and Cultural Institutes of uh, the Museum of C the Ministry of Culture of Italy. Uh, Maide, uh, Asso Restauro and the General Direction uh, have signed uh, uh, an MOU of cooperation. The workshop in Cuba first uh, and then uh, the opportunity of cooperating in uh, Palazzo Rivaldi is the first occasion of cooperation. Yes, hello and good afternoon to all of you. This MOU was signed in 2017 between the Secretary General and DG uh, Education and Research, together with Astor Stauro. The main aims include finding synergies in terms of cooperation also with private enterprises, and everything is aimed at research and uh, training in the framework of the Italian cultural heritage context and also with the uh, promotion of both Thank industry. you, Maria Adelaide. Let's start with uh, the third day of the Restoration Week 2010.
also Rebati, thank you very much to Nicola Gritti, Vice President of the Institute of Santa Maria in Aquino, the owner of the building, who is hosting us today in, uh, in Palazzo Rebati. Uh, just a brief technical uh, overview. Yesterday we have had uh, a lot of uh, questions uh, during the, the live show in the chat, uh, we, have, we haven't been able to answer during the live because I see that we are time and we are late. And, uh, but from today on, uh, all the answers uh, and the chat will be open 24-7 to give you answer. And so please continue to make questions, notes, technical notes. We are among experts. Uh, so we are seeking not only questions, but also suggestions, uh, comments uh, for new ways of uh, cooperating. Uh, we are here in Palazzo Vivaldi. You will see that uh, it is a very complex place, uh, even if we are very close to the Colosseum of Rome. So one of the most important areas in the world. Uh, we are talking about, again, about regeneration, and uh, again, as yesterday in Santo Stefano Sistiano, about, about abandon. Uh, Santo Stefano Sistiano, in Santo Stefano Sistiano, it's very easy to, to talk about abandon because we are in a local area very, with a very poor economy. It is probably strange today to talk about the same, to use the same word for past that is. 200 meters from one of the most important monuments in the world. So, uh, Palazzo di Valdi uh, was erected uh, uh, in the 15th century, in the 16th century, um, by Erado Silvestri, a private, the private secretary of the Pope Paolo III. And the project was designed by Antonio da Sangallo. So we are starting in a very, very important context. In the 17th century, uh, the main enlargement of the building and the change of its function, adapted to use, probably you are calling it today, uh, gave to the palace a new function as uh, Pio Istituto Rivaldi per le donne that so it was hosted mothers, orphans that had at the time some difficulties for charity reason and uh, it arrived to host more than 120 persons. In the 1900s uh, it was converted uh, in different ways in school. It was for to educate it. And now to decide what to do with this palace, the Ministry of Culture decided first to take advantage, advantage to the vocation of the palace. A work site is usually a closed place. In that context, a work site, a construction work site here is the site of the regeneration, an opportunity to make education. So it is now, before deciding what finally do with the, this building, uh, uh, a train world site. So we are identifying it now as uh, it was, as an educational uh, place. Um, first of all, uh, the manager, the Minister, the minister of Culture, its directions uh, is managing with uh, the restoration, the design for the restoration and the first use as a, an educational work site of, uh, of this building. So, first of all, a welcome from uh, Mauro, Mario Turetta, Director of uh, the Direzione Educazione Ricerca e Istituti Culturali of the Ministry, Italian Ministry of Culture, and then Daniela Borro, General Superintendent, uh, Special Superintendent of Rome. La Direzione Generale Educazione e Ricerca e Istituti Culturali 
dal benvenuto nel complesso Silvestri Rivaldi, nel cuore della Roma antica, al rappresentante del governo di Albania, nella persona del ministro Elba Margariti e alla delegazione internazionale, accompagnata dall'Agenzia per la promozione all'estero e l'internazionalizzazione, delle imprese italiane e dell'asso Restauro. Grazie infatti ad un accordo firmato nel 2017 dagli istituti Santa Maria in Aquiro con il Mibact e il Demanio, il palazzo con i suoi giardini e i ninfei, dal maggio 2018 è un luogo privilegiato di formazione attiva. Il contesto educativo e formativo del cosiddetto cantiere scuola avviato dall'allora direttore Francesco Scoppola ha consentito di riaprire il palazzo per le indagini, lo studio e la conoscenza del sito. Grazie anche agli accordi con le università Sapienza e Roma 3, con il CNR e attraverso le scuole di alta formazione afferenti alla DigiEric, sono state coordinate azioni di riscoperta di questo luogo. Ringrazio anche il lavoro congiunto del tavolo tecnico tra Direzione Generale, Soprintendenza Speciale Archeologica, Belle Arti e Paesaggio di Roma e la Soprintendenza Capitolina. Si auspica che il palazzo e i suoi giardini siano presto riconsegnati alla fruizione, mantenendo viva la vocazione voluta già nel Seicento da Monsignor Ascanio Rivaldi. Il patrimonio culturale è il luogo privilegiato per la formazione. Questo luogo che andremo a visitare, in particolare per la sua ampiezza e complessità, offre uno scenario ideale per le diverse professioni e professionalità che ruotano attorno alla ricchezza del patrimonio italiano. Attraverso lo strumento formativo del cantiere scuola si possono creare sinergie virtuose di collaborazione, condivisione e apprendimento dei saperi. Siamo tutti più consapevoli anche a causa della pandemia che stiamo attraversando che è quanto mai oggi necessario trovare percorsi comuni e sostenibili investendo con azioni incisive nella formazione delle generazioni più giovani. Buona visita a tutti. Dear Silvestri Rivaldi Palace is a building that dates back to the 16th century, which overlooks the uh, Imperial Fora close to the Colosseum. It belongs to the uh, uh, Santa Maria in Aquilo Institute, and unfortunately, for many decades, it has been a condition of uh, degradation. And in fact, uh, the uh, recovery started in 2018 when an agreement was signed uh, between uh, the government and the Ministry for Cultural Heritage, DG Education and Research, and the uh, Superintendency of Rome. So this agreement was aimed to the recovery, restoration, and enhancement of this beautiful building. So the uh, Institute for Conservation and Restoration has already carried out a number of uh, activities in a number of frescoes which were damaged and the superintendency of Rome has carried out a uh, special intervention on the walls and 
it also allocated the funds for the uh, recovery of the uh, uh, ceiling as well as of the missing parts. It is very important, however, especially for the uh, future uh, project, to have a uh, specific working group that involves uh, the Superintendency of Rome as well as the contribution of uh, the uh, La Sapienza University and Roma 3 University and also a financing allocated among the main projects within cultural heritage activities. We are in Rome, so archaeology in Rome is everywhere. Most of all, if you are 200 meters from the Colosseum. So, this palace, we said that this palace started, was erected in the 16th century, first, but of course, uh, before the 15th century, 16th century, in Rome, in that area, there was something else. So, archaeology in the study and uh, in the decision bring to the restoration project, project to the adaptive reuse of the, the building is very, very important. So, first of all, just to give a correct set, temporal segments of the intervention and the study, we are starting from archaeology. Maria Taloni will introduce the archaeological aspects of uh, uh, the, of the project here in Palazzo Rivaldi, like Maria, and uh, afterwards uh, the archaeologist Fatini and Moriconi will talk more deeply about the site. Thank you to everybody, both those uh, who are connected and streaming and those who are here. So I represent the uh, technical table that was established in December 2018 after an agreement between the Special Superintendency and the DG General uh, of the Ministry for Cultural Affairs and Santa Maria di Aquino, the owner of uh, Palazzo Silvestri Vivaldi, of this monumental complex. After this technical table, a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research was started with uh, uh, studies uh, uh, from various points of view uh, uh, over the history of the palace and the architecture as well in order to develop uh, a project to valorize and to allow, open up the palace to the public. Now, this uh, area is very important because already from the antiquity is very important due to its uh, position. The position is very important. The monumental complex uh, corresponds to the uh, hill of the Velia, which uh, existed already in the ancient times, so it was a strategic from a, uh, a topographic point of view, and uh, furthermore, it underwent many changes in time. Now, uh, at the present time, uh, more modern times, for example, there were works uh, for the underground, which those two changed the area. So, Francesco Moliconi and others carried out their study on the stratigraphy of the area in order to actually assess the changes that took place from the ancient times up to our present times. Thank you. So together with Francesco Moliconi, we will present a summary of our studies of the stratigraphy. So I'd like to start with some pictures, you can see other uh, areas, other palaces close to Palazzo Rivaldi, which is shown there in red. Then there is the Basilica di Massenzio and the Via dei Fori Imperiali. 
Now we will actually dive into the past because in the following image we will see the area as it was in the past. So from the left, as you will see, there will be a picture from the 30s. So there it is, a picture from the 30s showing clearly that the, the area was completely changed. There are some fountains, uh, some round fountains, and in fact uh, the uh, garden was characterized by the presence of so many fountains. In fact, it was one of the most beautiful gardens in Rome at the beginning of the 600s. Now, these are some interesting things that we found in our study uh, through the stratigraphy and uh, uh, other studies. Now, there on uh, that part, you can see the Basilica di Massenzio. So that era, area there, shown there, was the access to the Templum uh, Pacis. It was the access door to the Foro Romano. And as you can see, it changed very much after the excavations that took place in the 600s. So back in that time, you could access that area through that uh, uh, Door. Now, this is the basilica as it was in, in the 600s. There at the bottom, you see how it was in the 600s. This is the plan, the map in green. You can see the remains that we found. Uh, there is the loggia, with, uh, uh, and the blue and the red are those uh, uh, parts that date back to the 500s. Uh, uh, so, there on the right, uh, you can see some other images of the fountains that we were talking about before, uh, the fountain of San Francesco and others. So, these uh, are the uh, facades uh, uh, facing uh, Via del Colosseo. There, there is an incision and traces of uh, frescoes. Uh, uh, so, as you can see, the loggia, in fact, has some traces of frescoes. So, thank you very much. Now uh, we uh, will plunge into uh, some greater details over our work. We were saying we are jumping into the time from the Roman period to part of the period, the 1600s. So you, you are confining us into the underground part of the period. Yeah, to the end of the belly. So we see for the first time the, the belly. Great. Buongiorno, sono Giulio Fratini, archeologo dell'edilizia storica. Good morning, my name is Giulio Fratini, an archaeologist of historical buildings. In uh, one year time, we dealt with the analysis and study of the palace from the architectural standpoint. So let's start now from the uh, Studiolo Mediceo, and you see in this case that there is a modern opening, a modern door, and we access this initial room that divided, actually, and it was a sort of air passage between the two courtyards of the 16th century building. Around the walls, you still see some tests we made and where we found the different faces, the different layers from the 15th and 16th century. But then we access uh, this area that was entirely refurbished and this is a lodger and it was refurbished. So probably it had a host or it was a, a gallery for statues, so a sort of uh, exhibition. And along the walls, you see uh, the uh, different uh, uh, 15th and 16th century uh, walls. But then we found this wall 
at the end where you see Roman bricks. So it probably represented one of the uh, uh, walls leading to the next and adjacent room. So we are now entering in one of the very few places in which you still see the hill uh, that was somehow uh, the object of the changes in the 30s. So this is the underground area. You see uh, the door overlooking the courtyard and then the lodger at the end of the 17th century was transformed into a kitchen. So the underground area was a sort of warehouse for timber or coal. So let us continue now and we go towards Via dei Fori Imperiali, so what remains of the uh, uh, sides of the hill. And in fact, you see here with the uh, high vaults, so there is a uh, small room when you access the room where the uh, timber uh, was kept. And then if we move and continue beyond it, we enter one of the Roman areas that were at the basis of the hill. The effect here is quite surprising because you see that in these rooms made up of bricks are somehow hanging because of course during the excavations of the underground areas, so the underground areas of the 17th century, there was a first courtyard and this part that was uplifted as compared to the ground, well they remained with the uncovered foundations, but this allows us one thing in particular, that is to say, to see in particular uh, the main portion relating to the tuff of the hill. And here I see three walls made up of bricks dating back to the first century AC. Then the other structure that was the uh, well that was constructed in the second half of the 17th century. It's very high and it cuts the vault and it served the kitchen that had been built at the end of the 17th century, so from the lodge up to the terrace. And then you're going to meet Francesco, who's going to take us to the underground area. Here we are. So, thank you, Giulio. In this moment, we are inside of the cellars of uh, the Conservatorio delle Zitelle. Actually, this is something that was done around the 17th century, the beginning of the 17th century, by directly excavating the tuff. So you see the rock that was directly digged, and the signs are clear here of the devices and the tools used, as well as all of the uh, structures that were supporting the rooms. So different um, areas were identified. And here, for instance, foodstuffs and wine was kept. And also, for instance, uh, some crafts activity were carried out, especially in the area that we are about to reach in this moment. So you see here how fragile this part is. And in fact, despite of the uh, interventions made, well, this portion is still somehow fragile and it's uh, slightly collapsing still nowadays. And this is a fundamental part because this is the corner in which you find a new series of uh, rooms and homes that were organized one century later. So within the Roman rooms, actually some grottos were found dating back to the Romans, which were completely emptied and also with a sort of uh, difficult operation. And as you see here, you have some shields or coverings made uh, during the, um, let's say, the beginning of the 18th century. So it was possible in this way to access these areas. And in some of the holes you see on the wall, it is possible to see the Roman uh, walls and also in some other rooms. You also see the pillars that in back to the Romans, which were used as foundations of 
these portions. And here on the ground, for instance, you see a series of uh, ancient structures that were used at the end of the 18th century. So here in one of these holes, if you look inside of it, you may easily see the uh, Roman walls. Look, if you look inside of the hole, you may easily see the Roman walls. And here there are some complex structures to analyze because there are layers of subsequent interventions and uh, you see the Roman uh, portion and then the uh, 18th century one. And here you see an interesting thing in particular, that is to say, this arch. And in fact, you see here a double arched lintel, and this dates back to the Romans, whereas the one below it dates back to the end of the, the 18th century, uh, which is somehow supporting it and which has replaced the band that was probably here when there was an access and an entrance during the Roman period already. So if we turn the other side, you see the Roman wall that was then found during the excavations under the stairs. So when the grottoes, the Roman grottoes were emptied, then you see that wall, which is particularly interesting because it is also connected to the rest of the Roman structures that were found in the palace and in the opposite courtyard. So it is possible for us to sort of uh, reconstruct a clear uh, plan of the Roman ruins. So back on surface, the second courtyard of Palazzo Rivaldi, and in this area there are several interesting things. Please note this interesting wall, and this is what Cardinal Margotti asked for, and which includes a decoration of the garden and which also uses polychrome marbles to uh, create delicate mosaics and also fountains. The fountains are extremely uh, particular. I'll show you this fountain, which is the fountain of the shell, where you still see what is left of the uh, um, stucos, where water was flowing, and also you see the uh, reversed uh, tritons, and it's quite particular for that period of time. Uh, see you later. Uh, together with uh, Francesco Morriconi, we have stepped out uh, from the subterranean level to the ground floor, or actually from the ground floor, the entrance of the building, to the first of the noble floors where we are now and where we are outside in the yard with, uh, with uh, Francesco. Uh, let's come back to the adaptive reuse of the building uh, uh, which is in evolution. The Ministry have not made uh, a choice yet. It is not easy to, to find and to, in, to give an interpretation to the vocation of, uh, of this building. But first of all, we are still uh, respecting the former vocation of the building education. So we are still in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a school, if you want to to consider it, it is uh, a, a wide school managed by different uh, universities and different organizations. Um, a, word, a warm welcome from uh, Ales uh, Alessandro Viscogliosi, the Direttore della Scuola di Specializzazione per il Restauro Architettonico e il Paesaggio dell'Università La Sapienza di Roma, the postgraduate school in restoration of the University uh, of Rome, which is managing a part of this school. Buongiorno a tutti. 
evening. My name is Alessandro Viscogliosi, the director of the Specialization School for the Architectural Heritage Unit of the La Sapienza University, and I would like to greet all participants uh, uh, within the Restoration Week. So this year, uh, in this particular day, well, uh, we are in an important uh, palace because May uh, 2018, thanks to the collaboration with the DG for Education Research and uh, the uh, cultural institutions of MIBAC, uh, within uh, the restoration activities of Villa Silvestri, we also established a specific um, site for our specialization school. So Cantiere Scuola School um, site is an important moment for our students because for some of them, it is the first occasion on which they can uh, directly deal with the needs relating to this historical period and also with the skills and the technologies that are being used, it is possible to, uh, for instance, have contact with high-level professionals. And I wish to thank the directors we had, uh, Francesco Scopola and the other ones, which are also uh, teachers of our school. And we hope that Professor Mario Turetta wishes to continue with this collaboration. And we believe this collaboration is very important, also in consideration of the fact that in the past, uh, together with the uh, students from the uh, Society of Protection Building, uh, which is one of the most important associations uh, established by William Morris for the uh, spreading of uh, restoration techniques, as well as other universities like the uh, Roma Tre University, and also uh, the uh, uh, presence of knowledge and methodologies, then it is possible in this case to, we hope, to derive the best for future professionals. And for this the reason, I like to uh, greet all of you and thank all of you, uh, Mr. Esposito, Mr. Carbonara, and I wish you all a, uh, a fruitful continuation of these works and events. Different universities are cooperating in this uh, education uh, phase in the restoration of the building, in telling the story of this building to the world and in, educated, in educating architects uh, and professionals uh, in the field of restoration within this place and during the restoration phases. Uh, Maria Adelaide Ricciardi. Direction, uh, Direzione Educazione e Ricerca del MIBACT will tell us uh, something about uh, the educational worksite managed by the University La Sapienza. Once again, a uh, good afternoon and welcome. The experience, the experience carried out by the DG Education Research and cultural institutions, well, our experience was that of uh, testing uh, through our cultural heritage and through the monuments that we do have, well, to test a uh, training pathway open to universities, institutions, and research organizations. So the agreements and MOUs signed with uh, La Sapienza University, the Specialization School and Roma Tre University, allowed to uh, open the monument in a pilot project that included and encompassed hundreds of students this year, and which also accompanied, in a sense, an important and strong activity as from May 2018 up to today uh, in collecting information, making surveys and preliminary investigations. So the DG collaborated in a technical panel as already mentioned by the colleague Taloni and together with the Special Superintendency of Rome and the uh, Superintendency of uh, uh, Rome uh, well, with the main goal of drafting a shared project for 
possible future uses of these palaces. And I wish to thank all of the students that collaborated in the drafting of the projects, and in particular, the specialization school in May 2018 launched the first school site and building site. We have some problems with the slides. I hope I can uh, show them to you. Okay. So, as uh, the beginning of our uh, school activities, where well, uh, the uh, building site was organized and arranged. And we also decided to clean the entire area so that it was possible to access areas of the building that had been abandoned for many years. So the school site is an active area of uh, uh, debate and growth in order to share views and involving all those that operate in the framework of cultural heritage. So the debate among students, but also uh, students from several restoration schools, is a constructive approach, which allows to encompass all age brackets and professions uh, operating in the area of restoration to debate on the ground with concrete topics dealing with restoration and also new approaches to the uh, various uh, restoration uh, techniques. In particular, I'd like to uh, present to you some of the uh, studies that our students from La Sapienza University carried out. The thesis of uh, Mrs. Dottavi started from the restoration analysis that uh, started with the surveys of the topographic uh, maps. And the mosaic of works, of the works carried out in this time, as from 2018 up to date, is now being uh, uh, put together with the contributions of all of the students that are collaborating with us. I move on now to the project of Mrs. Gardino and Romano, and in particular, they dealt with the inclusion of the palace in the uh, uh, town planning context. So, such a broad complex at the heart of the ancient city uh, cannot be underestimated, of course and their specialization thesis has targeted to consider the uh, access flows and the possible uses of the building. So the approach is very interesting because they could consider some areas of the complex of the building that can be accessed by the citizens and tourists, as well as other areas which are devoted to museums and other areas devoted to education and offices. A particularly complex aspect will be that of concretely dealing with the uh, uh, vertical connections as well as distribution, because we are talking about over 4,000 square meters uh, of uh, indoor areas and 3,000 uh, square meters of gardens and uh, uh, outdoor areas. A possible option and one of the hypotheses to be considered is that of having this floor in which we are as a, uh, an exhibition area, uh, also as an exhibition as it is in itself or as a museum, and also, well, this will allow several assessments in terms of uh, enhancement of uses, but the use of technologies has been uh, uh, functional to the knowledge of uh, uh, the Silvestri Rivaldi complex, and in particular, Susanna Pacchetti has achieved uh, the main uh, 3D and topographic survey with scanning lasers, and uh, in particular, uh, in uh, uh, these uh, rooms and halls in which we are, in order to identify the and make surveys on the wooden ceilings. It also allowed to identify the structural problems which have been confirmed by the subsequent analysis in situ. 
Now, the surveys also uh, concern the outer areas, uh, 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 the gardens. We, so far, we haven't talked about uh, the gardens, uh, the, the waterworks, for example, which uh, were present all uh, over the uh, external area of the palace. And also the uh, doctoral course in engineering was aimed at actually reconstructing some of the, or restoring some of the um, external spaces with the beam digitalization techniques. I'd like to thank also Professor Mancini with her students, international students, who uh, those two uh, worked in the outer areas of the palace. Furthermore, there was a collaboration that was established with the uh, School of uh, uh, Cultural uh, Heritage, and uh, together with Architetto Ruggeri, uh, special uh, uh, topics were dealt uh, over the beam uh, digitalization and also the sustainability of uh, the uh, building site uh, of the restoration site, uh, we'll talk about that later. Now, in this uh, uh, phase, uh, we are uh, restoring the, uh, uh, the building that is uh, the most recent, and this will probably be the first uh, work that will uh, start. Now, that, thank you very much. Now, I'd like to hand the floor over to very much, the next Maide. speakers. I'm sorry. I used to to, to <laughs> use Maida as a name, Maria de la Aide. I am sorry. Uh, now we are switching from La Sapienza of Rome, the University of La Sapienza of Rome, to Roma 3, another university of uh, Rome. Elisabetta Pallottino, professor of restoration of the University of Roma Tre, and, uh, um, and she will talk about a brief introduction of uh, the exec uh, of the mm, I'm sorry educational uh, worksite managed by the, the university and uh, the executive master of uh, um, restoration of uh, Roma Tre. Thank you. Well, I will be very very brief. Uh, the time uh, allotted. Uh, is of around three minutes. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, ASO uh, Restauro, the agency ITA, for having organized this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful week uh, concerning restoration throughout all of Italy. Now, our meeting here in Rome is uh, so important. So I'd like to, first of all, say that I was uh, uh, very much helped by Maida because uh, the key word for me is uh, formation, training, and in fact the DG General for Education and Research has created this very special occasion uh, in which uh, uh, the three Italian, the three Roman universities were drawn together to focus over a common topic, uh, i.e. the recovery of the heritage and uh, restoration. So uh, I, uh, I know Professor Carbonara, I have known him for quite some time. I know also uh, Daniele Esposito. Daniele Esposito, she was the director of the school for so many years. So I know very well uh, that they work uh, uh, so hard in all of this. Now, it's very important to say that uh, uh, a public institution has drawn together these three universities and uh, has uh, spent time to organize uh, contributions under the ho common uh, 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 under the common umbrella of this uh, DG for uh, research uh, under uh, a common approach. Now, the Encyclopedia Treccani recently has created, has, has digitalized all of its um, works, uh, uh, and furthermore, the Encyclopedia Treccani has uh, also uh, 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 Considered, considered uh, teaching from a different point of view, i.e. that you know, students somehow, sometimes can teach and not only learn. And the same thing has happened also in this case, because in this case, uh, students were involved in first person in an active way, and this laboratory was undoubtedly a very, very interesting example, and I hope that this uh, 
uh, issue of this uh, palace that is so important at the very heart of center will finally be addressed and solved because unfortunately so far uh, it was not uh, this palace, uh, this wonderful building could not fully exploit uh, or express its, its full beauty. That said, I'd like to focus uh, and talk about uh, the second master's uh, methodology. Now we have a very well-established tradition. We're at the 15th edition of this master on uh, uh, architectural uh, re uh, restoration. Uh, it's uh, uh, a two-year master's. For us, methodology is very important. Uh, the Restoration School of uh, Roma Tre is in charge of that master's, and the aim is uh, that to put knowledge at the very heart of everything, to uh, uh, start by knowledge when talking about restoration. It, it is therefore an endogenous project. Uh, knowledge, uh, uh, of course, entails uh, two-thirds uh, of uh, the work because of our intention is to give this building, Villa Rivaldi, the sense, that it, the meaning that it had in time and also the meaning that it had throughout all of the years in the various years starting from when it was built and in the following years when it was uh, modified. So it is a project and, and at the building that actually uh, determines what has to be done within the project. Now, in the past three, two years, there were some changes as to our school, as to our master for restoration. Michele Zampili will talk more about uh, what we did in uh, Villa Rivaldi. Now, the novelty is the fo following. In the second year of study, there is an interdisciplinary, a multidisciplinary approach with the involvement also of public players. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, Stefano Converso, one of our professors within this master, within this master was uh, uh, entrusted with the task of, uh, uh, of teaching uh, Thank you. beam technology, Very as he will Professor explain. Pallottini. Of course, uh, re the restoration cannot, a project of restoration cannot be performed without a deep knowledge of uh, the project and to teach this uh, approach, which is not only Italian, but we can say mainly Italian, is very, very important for us and is one of the, ma the main issues we are dealing with uh, uh, today. Professor Michele Zampini, Professor of Restoration and Director of the Design Lab of the Executive Master of uh, La Roma 3, the Education Worksite. So I will uh, introduce you very briefly to the la activity of our laboratory of the master that Professor Palutino just uh, talked about uh, a couple of seconds ago. Now, kindly, if we can change to the following slide. So, the lab is uh, coordinated by Francesco Giovanetti and by me. It uh, uh, involves it. Uh, avails itself of many uh, professors from uh, of the Faculty of Architecture and also uh, other professors specialized in design, Cangiano and Spatafora, who uh, have uh, collaborated with us for many, many years. Now, as I told you, we uh, were specifically involved with Palazzo, Palazzo Rivaldi, and in particular, we created uh, or we uh, focused on two different uh, uh, areas and two different uh, uh, things. Now, in uh, um, spring and summer, we first of all uh, carried out a survey of all of the architectural elements and the wooden structures of uh, the uh, palace based on the um, restoration and manuals that uh, um, are used by our school. So the wooden works, the, um, the ceilings uh, in wood, uh, not the cassettonati ones that you see here, which were studied by others, but the more ordinary ones, which nevertheless represent a very important uh, testimony of the constructive uh, a technology, albeit a, a bit more 
modern. And then the uh, uh, wooden uh, uh, frames, uh, window frames, uh, especially in the modern part of the building, which is still conserves some of the uh, signs of the 500s with some details that are very accurate and very interesting, which may subsequently be uh, used also in the, f in the subsequent phases of the restoration. Then in the second part of the laboratory, we uh, focused on the evolution uh, of uh, our fabrica. And we started and we studied the various evolution phases, uh, the evolution, uh, now with uh, uh, the exception of a couple of uh, details. For the most part, uh, our studies uh, are in line with the studies of uh, Cremona and Iacantus, with some slight differences. So in particular, we uh, focused on the two fronts in the main yard. Uh, uh, so we carried out a survey with the laser scanner, and then we digitalized everything. So uh, these are the uh, outlines which we uh, were able to produce, and in the end we came out with, with, with a critical outline which uh, uh, was able to, to, to help us out uh, uh, over the evolution that took place within the past. Now here you can see some modifications that took place during time, for example. For example, this area that changed during the years, or those uh, windows uh, that are at the higher story, which are not very clear, however, because they are not at all in line with the internal asset, the internal part of where there is the uh, uh, larger uh, staircases. So we have to understand uh, what happened there. That said, the novelties, the more inter interesting ones, uh, however, uh, refer to the other side, uh, the one that faces the Colosseum. Uh, now, uh, a survey, a very detailed and accurate one, was carried out with the mapping, a cryptical mapping of all of the archi architectural elements that were present. And here we can see that there were a whole set of anomalies that existed and which uh, undoubtedly uh, tell us that this uh, fabrica uh, underwent uh, uh, an evolution that was very complex and not completely clear. For example, there are some walls that were uh, uh, resting on existing frames, and this shows that, that the monumental staircase may have grown or been extended throughout time. Now, one aspect that perhaps is not well known instead is the presence of some signs on the uh, uh, walls in the facade, some signs which may indicate, may tell us that there were uh, some trabiations and, and also some graphite, graphite, which may suggest that this facade may may have been uh, uh, refined uh, in uh, uh, how you see there on the slide. So the uh, hypothesis uh, may help us perhaps better understand uh, how the asset, uh, the originary asset of the uh, palace was. That's it. I uh, have uh, Thank you, Professor Zampidi. And thank you. Uh, last but not least uh, of the architectural part of this, uh, this speech uh, is related to BIM technology, building information modeling, which is the future of the building industry. But of course, uh, restoration is uh, usually uh, more complex than the normal new building construction uh, area. So, and as it is more complex restoration, applying this kind of technology, building information modeling to restoration is highly more complex because we are dealing not only with uh, shapes but we or materials, but we are dealing with uh, strange shape, deformed shape by the time and uh, a series of different layers which are very important in the restoration 
um, project. Stefano Converso, professor of digital design at uh, Roma 3, will, will explain us how they manage with uh, building information modeling here in uh, Palazzo Rivaldi. Thank you. Uh, perfect introduction. I don't have to speak anymore, I think. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, it's, uh, first of all, I want to spend like some seconds of my five minutes to tell people watching that we are in a fantastic location. And I think it's, it's, uh, you know, it's probably the reason why we're all so fascinated by studying history, trying to apply even the most advanced technology to the stones that we were born and that we live in every day. And in my case, it's uh, very hard because uh, I will present you a research um, that is, uh, uh, gr let's say, it comes from two grants. The major grant is from, the, of course, the Direzione Generale di Ricerca and the Ministry. Uh, and we merged uh, this uh, chance with a grant research grant that we got from a software company uh, called Autodesk, but it could be another one. Uh, because, uh, it's, as, as mentioned, it's really difficult uh, to, let's say, uh, apply to the kind of buildings we are in, technologies that are born in totally, completely different domains. Like we, uh, the software that the, it's called BIM or even parametric technology is used in the completely different industries. And all the ecosystem that is around it was bought for a totally different reason. So I fully understand why many people are skeptical. I even don't like many of the, the so-called heritage beam models uh, that I could see even around today. And so, when I started this project, my first problem was how not to do the same, you know? And uh, uh, you see, uh, this is, for example, an interesting aspect that is how to bring a little bit of life into these models. Because I think the main problem is that there is no time. So, uh, you know, we are in the, in the era, in the years of instant. Everything comes to the instant, you know? Information is instant. Uh, everything comes into the, right into the moment. And, uh, and in, instead, here, the time is very important. So one of the uh, uh, chances that we have is to bring life and time into stones is, for example, through sensors. So if you see here, this is uh, one of the most advanced now uh, visualizations that bring the numbers of sensors, of mapping the changes even the changes into how we restore stones, what this, the discoveries we have, into uh, a digital domain. A domain that uh, is used to do stuff like this. You know, you know that all the turbines today have the so-called digital twins. So the physical turbine is connected to a virtual turbine and all the data from the physical turbine go to the virtual uh, turbine. But even here there is life. These uh, people here, are working on, the, on this building, and they will, be, they will be working for years, and it will be the subject of the education that will happen into this building. So what we've done, we sent one of our researchers into this uh, accelerator of technology uh, devoted to restoration. He was the only one thinking about how to develop this technology into restoration. And uh, then there is a lot of uh, problems because, you know, there you have times and signs uh, that are very complex. Uh, it's not today the day that we have to discuss how to split objects that are one big object into signs, into traces, into you know all the complexity of something that cannot be divided like a mechanical piece, you know, or like a turbine. How to you know see the simplification? It's too much. So how to avoid? What we've done into the Palazzo Silvestri Rivaldi model is to build a framework, a framework of information that, that lies online. You see a timeline below, and what we have done is just simply put this framework on and collect all the knowledge of people like Michele, like Elisabetta, like my, our colleagues from La Sapienza, from the beautiful presentations, from the students that will be here and will be working here, so it's, uh, we call it H-twin. So 
an historical twin of the activity of the building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano, if I can. Yes. You can, okay, okay, thank you very much. So, a third level of uh, intervention in uh, Palazzo Rivaldi. Uh, Professor Elisabetta Pallottino was mentioning before the importance uh, of the knowledge process uh, in the restoration the design and uh, intervention. It is uh, a knowledge that have to be accurate on structures, uh, on volumes, on surfaces, materials, uh, and every history, of course, which, be, which take us to the archaeology, to the archaeology, but and more, but but have to represent deeply. The more deeply he can the building before making any design choice. Uh, Asso Restauro, as one of the representatives of uh, the culture of restoration in uh, in the world, have. Uh, has always based uh, its activities on that method. First, know, then decide, design, and intervene with the restoration. Uh, Asso Restaro, as we were saying at the beginning with Maria Adelaide Ricciardi, has been part of this, uh, this project. We are very glad. I am a representative of Asso Restauro in that moment, so we are very glad to be part of this, uh, this process. Uh, and uh, uh, Nicola Berlucchi, Berlucchi conseller of uh, Asso Restauro and uh, director of the group of companies involved in the knowledge process of, uh, of the palace is telling something more about this knowledge process. Good morning to everybody. Thank you for your attention. I'm Nicola Berlucchi, CEO from Studio Berlucchi, and I'm uh, trying to explain to you how we did our study for the two main uh, decorative ceilings uh, of Palazzo Silvestri Rivaldi. And uh, uh, forgive my English, not so technical, but I hope you will understand and uh, understand the, our approach, uh, our conservative approach. Here is Palazzo Rivaldi, some of you are already there, some others are connected via web. And uh, our task uh, was to study the two floors that you see here to consolidate and strengthen this floor to allow people to visit Palazzo Rivalti in a safe way. From the law, the two ceilings from Sala Imperatore and Sala dei Pagani are the two important ceilings that we have to conserve and try to make a restoration and conservative project. Uh, we started from a photographic survey, very detailed, of the both ceilings. Of course, uh, this presentation wants to show you in short time how a methodological approach can give uh, good results and very detailed uh, intervention project. Uh, we started with analysis, a preliminary analysis about degradation made by company Leonardo that is expert uh, in restoration and diagnostic of surfaces. We, we analyzed uh, all the conservation uh, problems of this floor. You can see from the movie, it from the, this little movie, we have the degradation of wood, the uh, exfoliation of colors, uh, we have uh, a two original ceilings uh, with not many layers of colors but uh, in a very bad uh, state uh, of conservation and with some parts uh, that are have been changed uh, during the time uh, you see this is a flat uh, panel instead of uh, a panel with cornish uh, like the others so we have many substituted parts and uh, we didn't know how it was built, this roof, how it was suspended to the structural floor, and how was the, the conservation of the structural beams and the floor. 
So we had to mix uh, chemical analysis to define conservation uh, of the decorative apparatus and some uh, diagnostics to define the real structure and the conservation of the structure. You see here some knots, uh, some cracks, uh, some, uh, and we, we, we didn't even know if the ceilings were suspended to the structure or were in an independent way with an independent structure. We started with thermography to give idea of uh, this homogeneity. We continued with uh, stratigraphic uh, uh, tests with uh, blades and uh, we defined, we connected this with some chemical analysis that gave the composition. You see the fibers of the wood. This is transversal, this is longitudinal and the thickness of the color, the presence of any might be possible different colors. In this case, we saw that this was original 16th century color because we, you don't see any other layers below. And uh, here you see the composition of the wood with the electronic microscope. You can get uh, the deep conservation and the materials that are inside. And here some analysis about insects, about, uh, you see these holes from insects uh, in the wood. Then uh, the micro electronic microscope can give, and oh, this FTR can give you uh, all the organic uh, glues and resin that keep the colors together. With the microscope uh, electronic, we get the composition of the elements, calcium silicate, and then an analysis of the mortar deep analysis that can give you composition, cracks, uh, quantity of lime, and this kind of diagnostic has been integrated by Legno Doc, that is a company from Astro Restauro, very expert about uh, wooden conservation, and Legno Doc gave, paid more attention to the structural uh, reconstruction and the quad the qualification or how to how the structure is made what i said before how we you see we have different structure from the two fl floors imperatori and pagani in one case uh, the decorative floor is suspended to the structure in the other case uh, in the other situation the uh, decorative uh, floor ceiling is separate by, by uh, the structural uh, uh, floor. Uh, with these sketches and these analysis, uh, uh, Legno Doc has qualified every beam, every element. Uh, we are now, we have a map of all the degradation and the qualification of any uh, wooden uh, uh, beam. You see with this uh, uh, scalpel or with uh, a, a resistograph that can give uh, uh, the resistance and the state of conservation in the main places like for example the where the beams go in the wall in the wall in the wall so in this part uh, it's important to define if we have humidity we have deep degradation that could lead to collapse and all these results are resumed summarized in, a, in this uh, data sheet that gives uh, the quality and the, the type of wood and then uh, the decor the um, following the laws uh, it, it can uh, give uh, the level of the resistance of the wood these are all data that are necessary to define any calculation after this uh, we could be able to prepare a three-dimensional model to insert all the data to define the state of conservation and to define a structural project for reinforcement. How did we do this? We used beam uh, technology in a very deep and uh, detailed way. The position we reconstructed in our company the entire roof and uh, with any every detail you can see here uh, we try to follow the 
disomogeneous situation of the roof uh, in, in, with the AutoCAD and with the Revit modeling, modeling the floor and the ceiling, uh, trying to get the more realistic as possible. Every suspended part has been uh, drawn and uh, you see every added, every little element, uh, so that uh, the 3D reconstruction is not a virtual reconstruction, it's a real situation of the reality. And you can see that at the end we had these two ceilings that are, and two floors that are, can be cut everywhere, can be analyzed, and every little part, I will show you later, in the next uh, slide, every little part has uh, its name, its number, it says how it's connected, how it stays, if it's in a good condition, and you can see here the final result of BIM is a data sheet with every element is defined from the color, the state of conservation, the volume, the surface, and we can use this data for any evaluation, historical, to know how many parts have been replaced, uh, conservative, uh, to know which part have uh, cracks uh, or uh, exfoliation, and any information that could you use. After this, uh, we started to deal with the structural reinforcement because this floor, from our analysis, was not able to take loads more than 100 kilo per square meter. Remember that uh, for a museum, the law requires 400 kilos, so four times the present uh, uh, allowance of load. How can we do? And in the same time, we try to think for a structural reinforcement that could be even seismic reinforcement. So we have to guarantee more loads and more seismic response. How did we do this? I tried to analyze what did they, they did do in the past. In the past, they had a beam sometimes to get uh, to improve the old original beams. We did, after thinking a lot, that we thought that this was the best method because it was the most conservative method. We have floors with no importance. This is uh, recent uh, tiles and cement mortars. We thought uh, to work from the top. We took off this mortar in the project. We put some new wooden and new beams uh, instead. But the difference is that uh, we try to make uh, the wood work as an entire beam with T-shaped beam that is much stronger than the original beams that were only these ones. If you look at the 3D, maybe you can better understand. Our proposal is to insert a new beam with uh, some steel uh, support to the walls so we will not make any hole in the wall and then to put new parts of wooden part here but even in the old parts uh, to get a continuity of this beam connected to the double plank this is the original one this is a new one that can give a kind of t shape this is from the statical point of view then, if you consider that all these wooden parts will be connected by nails or screws, this uh, is a structural diaphragm that uh, can be connected to the walls and give uh, a perfect uh, horizontal diaphragm that is perfect for seismic uh, analysis. After this, we have increased uh, to 400 kilos per square meter the loads and we have in the same time conserved in a perfect way the old structure and made and applied a conservative and reversible way of strengthening the structure. This is the result. We will have even some local intervention, but we have don't, don't have time to explain for it. 
I hope everything will be cle it's cleared and I'm available for any question. Thanks. These are the companies that have been working here and I thank you for the attention and uh, I'm stay at your disposal for any email. Thanks a lot. So thank you to Nicola Berlucchi, uh, director, board of directors of Asso Restauro. Uh, archi archaeology first, today, then architecture and education. Now we are talking about surfaces, decoration. We are in a completely decorated uh, environment uh, and we are in a restoration uh, work site, as you can see. Someone, while we are talking, is uh, working up there. And that means, uh, that, that is the reason why this is uh, an educational work site, because uh, education is part of the design. We are today talking with uh, an international invited uh, guests of professionals from all over the world, but the work site is still going on. Someone, the restorers, are still working here with us in the same room. So, decoration. Renata Pintus, again, Direzione Educazione Ricerca, Art Historian, the Ministero dei Beni Culturali, the Ministry of Culture is introducing to us the decorative set of uh, the building and focusing on the three main room we are visiting today. Buonasera a tutti. Innanzitutto, come storico dell'arte, mi sono occupata insieme alla collega della Sosa Porti Roma. So good evening to everybody. Together with Costantini, I have a catalog and uh, uh, indexed all of the data that was already available. I mapped uh, the various uh, surfaces of this palace that, as you can imagine, is uh, rather large. Now, in the first floor, about 70% of the surfaces uh, in the walls uh, are covered by uh, frescoes and by paintings on the walls. So, as you can see, this uh, worksite is undoubtedly very, very large. That said, now, of course, uh, the, the, the painting uh, mm, uh, follows what happened uh, throughout the years uh, within the palace. And sometimes uh, we are fascinated, uh, we're fascinated by work sites uh, such as this uh, because the paintings very often are hidden, sometimes hidden uh, behind uh, many layers uh, of paint, of superimposed paint. Uh, uh, over the uh, originals that dated back to the 500s. So this, of course, means that the restoration requires a lot of time. It is rather complex, but it also means that for us, art historians, uh, it is work that is very often very rewarding, very interesting, because sometimes we discover some paintings with a cycle uh, with a decoration history that is so very interesting, and sometimes paintings that are very, or, or rather, uh, uh, in good conditions and also of a good quality. Now, as to uh, the uh, historical and artistic side, i.e., as to who actually painted them, painted them, we can act. We cannot uh, come to definitive results. The decoration cycle, however, was rather well known. It is rather uh, uh, important. In the 600s, uh, uh, mention was already made to them. The restorers uh, will perhaps uh, talk more in detail what uh, they uh, they did in their work. So, as I was saying, 500s, uh, and which probably. Uh, 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 it refers uh, to uh, uh, the manierists in uh, the uh, uh, Tuscany area, probably the Bottega di Perin del Valle. Now, uh, Aurelio Silvestri was uh, a, a figure that was very close uh, to uh, Pope uh, uh, Paul III uh, from the Farnese family, and uh, that was the painter that uh, 
uh, actually worked for that family back uh, in those years. And now we're talking about uh, the second uh, half of uh, of the 500s. So in the first focus, we will talk about the commitment, about the, the, the people who actually committed these, uh, these and, and called and asked for those works. Now in this hall, this hall was obviously monumental, not only for the decorations that are present here, but also because it was uh, placed at the very um, entrance of uh, the palace itself. Uh, now there is uh, Francesco Salviati. We have the name, uh, Trace, uh, 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 that refers to that painting. Um, now we will have to f wait for the Consortium Roma, Roma to f finish their work uh, to see whether actually it was painted by him or not. Then Roberta Cucchietti, she worked uh, in a, a, a smaller room, uh, a much smaller room than the one in which we're here. Uh, and we're talking about the uh, end of the 500s, uh, and that was the part of the palace uh, that was uh, uh, used by Alessandro de, Medici, de Medici, sorry, he was a pope, albeit for just three months, uh, and uh, he uh, uh, used this palace after the uh, death of Renata, uh, uh, as Renata said, so now we are moving into three different rooms. The first is the one we are Talking now with Alessandra Risolo, Roma Consorzio, La Sala delle Divinità Pagane, cosiddette. So, good afternoon to all of you. And I'm here to uh, describe to you and show to you the works we are carrying out. So, these are the uh, restoration works of the paintings decorating this room. And this restoration aims at unveiling the original decorations uh, that depict a number of gods as well as uh, uh, mythological stories. And the second purpose is to, uh, uh, of course, achieve their conservation. Of course, the palace has been abandoned for a while now, and consequently, uh, restoration is needed. So. This is the uh, wall in which we are working. The work started in uh, 2018, um, and the DG uh, entrusted us with this task. And we found some uh, areas that had been cleaned already when we started to work. And in fact, these were the first surveys that allowed us to understand that there was a widespread uh, presence of uh, wall paintings below uh, the uh, paintings which are rather recent, conversely. And in these images, you see the upper part, the upper portion that you can also see uh, live because it's in this room, in this hall. And uh, as we were removing, for instance, uh, the um, um, colors, uh, overlapping decorations, we gradually saw these figures. So if the restoration is an important moment in terms of knowledge, and this is always the case when it comes to a works of art, then this is even more so when you intervene and you want to uh, uh, unveil a totally new surface. So the collection of any piece of information is fundamental because restoration is uh, important, especially when you collect data from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mm, material standpoint. Uh, the following pictures show what we already uh, identified in terms of uh, techniques, because all of the paintings, also because this is a set of frescoes characterized uh, by, for instance, um, uh, these uh, plaster portions, and uh, there's a mixed technique in this hall. And then we collect any technical data, and we take pictures of all the details. For instance, in this case, we have a uh, specific sign that we have marked with a spatula, because any technical information allows us to uh, subsequently make some hypotheses when it comes to the analysis of the work. 
And in this case, for instance, the paintings show all of the uh, uh, techniques relating to, uh, for instance, the uh, um, press, uh, the uh, mm, plaster, and we have direct uh, engravings, which are shown here when it comes to the architectural side. And we also have, for instance, a number of traces of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, additional materials which have been put on it and which have uh, uh, darkened the image. But these elements are very important for us because they outline the type of technique that was used and how many, for instance, operators and with which specific techniques technique have intervened and have worked on these uh, walls. And then we can trace back uh, the contributions of different authors. And also, for instance, uh, uh, the decorations. Uh, and we also see a specific uh, engravings uh, that are carried out in such a way as to transporting the image from uh, a previous uh, drawing up to the uh, plaster. And that was also made through pouncing. And also, in this video, we wanted to show to you the main techniques that we have used in the uh, restoration phases. So this is a specific and delicate uh, activity, and it's in particular a, a dry finishing approach, and uh, everything is done uh, by a B3 and by hand, and in fact you see that on each single gel is used, which has to soften the surface in order to uh, help the operation, and also uh, we have a consolidation activity, and in particular for all of those uh, um, paintings uh, that are um, that have to be, uh, uh, let's say, consolidated. And in fact, in this case, we do uh, intervene on all of the areas that require our intervention, as you can see from this video. And then also. There were also the cleaning uh, activities that were performed through the uh, use of a gel applied on the surface, which helped us to remove uh, the uh, layer of dirt that was on the wall. And then you see the sequence, because we uh, put the gel on it, and then we removed the gel. And then you see the square part of the cleaning that uh, we have achieved. So all of these activities have been uh, uh, carried out on a portion of the wall. But these are pictures of the uh, cleaning. And I'm showing them to you so that um, you can have a clear idea of what the situation is, because, of course, um, for a hundred years, these uh, uh, paintings were left um, to see in the open air. And of course, at a certain point, they were covered. But in several areas, they had been repainted already. So uh, they had been restored already. And this is data that we collect, but we have no certain answers or solutions. Because, for instance, uh, I don't know whether, for instance, uh, uh, these additional interventions uh, date back to uh, uh, a specific period. This is something we are investigating now. But this shows, for instance, the surface as it was found with a green or a brown color. Um, and then you see the painting. And then through the cleaning, we have succeeded in showing the original image. And this is the subject of a mythological scene. And this is probably uh, a scene uh, that we have, in particular, which is the rape of Proserpina. And we hope we can uh, uh, unveil the entire room and we can then study it and provide everyone with as information as possible. And then uh, I'm sure that the maintenance in the building will help us to understand the various steps in terms of uh, different layers. And this is fundamental for us in order to have a clear picture of the entire situation. Grazie, Alessandra. From the Sala uh, delle Divinità Pagane, we are walking into the Sala degli Imperatori. 
The Room of Emperors, Carla Giovannone, ICR di Roma, Istituto Centrale del Restauro. Good afternoon. Of course, well, thank you Microfono. so much for Microfono. inviting me. Microfono. Microfono. Nel progetto di and for allowing us to uh, participate in this uh, specific project linked to uh, the restoration of uh, this uh, Rivaldi Palace. And this is something we are doing with the uh, uh, Central uh, Restoration Institution, which, uh, of course, is a uh, university uh, course. And uh, as from September 2018, up to February 2019 with two uh, different classes of students of the uh, second uh, year uh, dealing with uh, wall paintings in particular, we had the uh, opportunity uh, to analyze the uh, uh, other room, which is the Hall of the Emperors. And in the video, you have a, uh, a an overview of the parts which have been unveiled uh, during the very few months in which we have worked with our students and which have had this extraordinary opportunity uh, to work on uh, a, a painting that, as Renata Pinto said, is of very high quality. And also, this is something which is completely new. I hope the slides are shown. So here you see an image of the documentation. So the work, as Alessandra Rizzo said, well, the activity starts uh, with a preliminary investigation where we collect data on the uh, main materials and execution techniques. So the uh, state of the art, let's say, of the uh, northern uh, war, which we mainly worked, but also relating to uh, some activities in particular, uh, on uh, the uh, eastern and western wall. So we mapped through uh, a uh, CAD. Uh, we had uh, eliminated the plaster and we have, for instance, uh, analyzed uh, for in the specific situation of the paintings. So you see, for instance, how the very last the 20th century uh, maintenance, uh, well, it, uh, for instance, was hiding a number of uh, wall paintings. Uh, and uh, in the preliminary phase, uh, we have, uh, for instance, shown all of the uh, uh, tests carried out with a history uh, by students in order to have a uh, knowledge of the original surface. So gradually, uh, and by means of a controlled and progressive cleaning that avails itself of the use of uh, nanotechnological materials, including the uh, uh, very uh, latest gels, where well, it is possible to gradually uh, approach the original paintings by uh, deep uh, plastering uh, the wall. And Gradually, we were opening these windows, let's say, that were showing a gray monochrome uh, pictorial um, works in a, uh, a for instance, uh, a golden bronze color, and especially in the niches and with the emperors that we are about to see. And this is a phase of the consolidation of the uh, um, uh, pictorial technique that has some uh, um, specific traits. And then you see the figures, which have been entirely unveiled. So it was a huge emotion, and it was really touching for us uh, to show these parts of the wall paintings, which were new, unknown, and uh, which had been uh, covered over the years, but never restored. So they were... Mm, let's say, untouched uh, in the details of the uh, techniques. And in fact, you see uh, a specific overlapping of the uh, uh, plaster and on, then the frescoes, uh, and also the uh, uh, specific paintings that is in a sort of 3D uh, approach, if you consider uh, the very good level of conservation of the paintings, whereas other, uh, that other 
other areas that had been scratched, well, they had been restored in the past in a, I would say, known perfect way. And uh, I continue with the images, and I'd like to show to you another image of another emperor, a detail of the face and also one of the uh, uh, niches uh, in, uh, and in particular one of the herms uh, in which the emperors are capped and with the golden browns and with the use of very, very limited amount of pigments like natural, uh, for instance, colors. And also, for instance, uh, and this is uh, a specific activity of scaffolding, which we have uh, de-plastered some areas where there seems to be a big scene depicting a battle. So these are some of the details of the Western Wall. Uh, with a, a detail of the legs of a character and also the leg of a lion with indirect engravings and showing, therefore, the preliminary drawing uh, that was put on the plaster. And then also the uh, detection of all of the techniques is very important for us in order to know what the execution site was, what was the master uh, that uh, was uh, somehow guiding all of these paintings. And then on the western part of the wall, we see the shoes of another character depicted and with a uh, uh, golden uh, color and also the angular uh, emblem or a symbol which is missing on the central part. And uh, then also the uh, beautiful portion that you see here on the right hand side when you see, for instance, a number of uh, trophies in a golden bronze. So I like to thank the DG uh, for involving us in these activities. I'd like to greet you all on behalf of the director of our institution, uh, Mr. Luigi Ficacci, who could not be with us in this uh, beautiful uh, Thank meeting. you very much, thank Carla. You. Last but not least, uh, a uh, young graduate from the Instituto Centrale del Restauro, Roberta Cucchietti, will take us to the Studiolo a Grottesche. Good afternoon. I uh, recently graduated at the University in Rome. And I have a video that I'd like to show to you. And I will show to you the so-called Studiolo Grotesque uh, that was carried out uh, by the decision of Cardinal de Medici in 1591 in the second historical phase of the palace. So the wall paintings we see on the vault are decorating the room with a main theme. And it is integrated on the ceiling through the emblem of the Medici family and also uh, with the allegoric figures on the four sides of uh, the room. So differently from the other rooms uh, that have been uh, overpainted over the years by additional layers, well, in this case, there are no specific uh, additions that hide uh, the visibility of the uh, paintings. And uh, what we see is a layer of dust and that was layered over the centuries and which is altering the correct, uh, let's say, relationship between the original painting and uh, uh, the rest. So um, the, uh, the area that is in the worst, let's say, uh, conditions in terms of uh, conservation is this one where we see a loss of the painting, mainly due to the critical environmental conditions of the building, and this is the uh, ribbed vault, and also the fact that the uh, building has been abandoned before the recovery. But between uh, 2018, 2019, and also with the announcement project by the uh, DG, uh, this became the object of analysis and also university thesis, as it happened with my university, and graduation thesis. And in fact, in the pilot restoration intervention, there, there's also the inclusion of a research, a scientific research, that is based on a number of innovative restoration pro 
products through nanotechnologies as, as tested, for instance, on uh, the paintings, and which comes from the um, EU project funded by Horizon 2020. So before the restoration works, it was necessary to take pictures and to have a clear uh, image of the uh, conditions of the paintings and also where the 3D images of the vault and also the, the images of the uh, hall. So uh, the restoration works uh, uh, also required the uh, analysis of the execution techni techniques and also the evolution of uh, uh, the uh, um, conditions, let's say, of the surfaces also below the painting. In fact, it was necessary to carry out a number of thermographic analyses uh, on the walls. And in this case, for instance, uh, these activities were uh, carried out by the Rome Three University and uh, through a diagnostic imaging uh, devices and also thanks to the collaboration with the other institutions that were involved in the restoration uh, project within the building. And as regards the main materials, uh, we carried out the chemical analysis and also the plaster and the pigments. That this was done by some experts that work within the institution. And in particular, a careful uh, observation of the painting allowed us to identify the dry uh, painting technique. So this is not fresco, rather it is a, uh, a specific uh, dry painting that is put on the plaster and also uh, on by um, the um, sketch with a black pencil and then colored. Then we also find the golden uh, color that has been, been put on the specific images. And on the right hand side, you see the detail of a uh, main people of one of the allegorical pictures that it, is painted with a dolphin head and uh, which shows, for instance, the, uh, the contour. And based on the scientific analysis, uh, this is a uh, uh, golden lamina approach, uh, as you see on the uh, left hand side, and uh, also emerging from the uh, microscope. Uh, uh, analysis and also uh, we marked in yellow all of the areas in which we found fragments of the golden interventions and uh, on the basis of all of the investigations carried out we have planned the conservation intervention and since this is a pallet restoration it included four main areas of action which are considered as significant so in all of the areas our restoration uh, work was uh, carried out which allowed allowed us to define the final plan, the final project, allowed to show to you the main operations and activities of the work, that is to say the consolidation for the recovery and the protection of the painting that risked to uh, disappear, then the cleaning, as I said, that is done with some uh, important, um, let's say, um, it's also in consideration of the uh, conditions of the wall and uh, for which the painting was very much delicate and then also uh, the uh, possibility to fill the gaps in terms of uh, um, plaster, and then the uh, pictorial intervention that uh, was uh, carried out also according to the main principles of the restoration approach, and then allowing a continuity of images and then improving uh, the uh, general condition of the work of art. So uh, this is the result uh, of what we have achieved, and this is a comparison between the first and the last intervention. Then you see, for instance, the uh, evolution of the interventions we carried out. So the uh, golden part, and then also, for instance, uh, the opening in the uh, ripped vault. And then you see the difference between the first image I've shown to you and the other one due to the condition of the material, which has changed, of course, over the uh, centuries. And I'd like to conclude by showing to you the very last area of intervention, which is the uh, broadest one in which we obtained a recovery of the cleaning of the white background, which is able to enhance, uh, in particular, the beauty of the painting. So thank you so much for your attention. That's all for me. Grazie, Roberta. Thank you.
Yeah. It is clear that you have uh, uh, a clear future because a restorer needs not only to be able to restore things but also to explain and we think that you have been very great in that. Uh, we are very close to the end, uh, just a technical communication for our hosts uh, online. The Zoom link for the thematic uh, session after the live show from Palazzo Rivaldi is now open. We have decided to open it a little bit in advance to let you the possibility to prepare to deepen uh, what we are discussing now with uh, with the exp experts uh, and uh, talk with the companies that are Italian companies that are connected with us uh, today. Uh, Palazzo Rivaldi have clear clearly expressed uh, uh, its vocation for education but also for innovation. Uh, Stefano Converso was talking about uh, the BIM modeling, BIM modeling. Carla Giovannoni was referring to nanomaterials for the consolidation and um, for the consolidation of the of the surfaces. Palazzo Rivaldi, in its vocation for innovation, it's not innovative, but it's uh, the future of our construction and restoration industry. Will to, will, is dealing also with the sustainability. As you probably know, Italy has developed, uh, the Green Building Council Italy has developed uh, the unique protocol related to historical buildings. So Marco Mari, Vice President of the Green Building Council, is closing this live show from, uh, from Palazzo Rivaldi. We will see you later for the final greetings. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you to invite uh, Green Building Council Italia. Um, we are, uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to stay here. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, not in presence, uh, but maybe this online way can be helpful for us uh, to give uh, a little support to your important event. So bringing sustainability to forefront of renovation with GBC story building for a sustainable heritage is the, the focus of this short presentation. And please uh, let me present, let me introduce uh, GBC Italia. We are a no-profit association with a mission on leading the entire building and real estate supply chain uh, in the direction of sustainable, sustainable transformation of the building environment. Uh, GBC Italia uh, represents all the subjects uh, of the building and the real estate supply chain from design to construction to operation and maintenance. Uh, and um, inside our member, there are some public administration, uh, universities, and a lot of knowledge about building in general, green building mainly. GBC Italia is a partner of US GBC, United States Green Building Council, and is an established member of the World GBC. And World GBC is the largest organization in the world for the sustainability of the construction sector. Uh, my short message is related to a great transformation. Um, we are looking at this great transformation building a real estate sector. A great innovation process of forming business model, design, construction projects, and technology. And this transformation can be compared to uh, the change that uh, quality culture um, forever for manufacturing in the past decades is driven by mainly by sustainable protocols of green building. And it's a huge amount of market, more or less five uh, trillions of square meters around the world. The only sector that is growing and is growing faster and uh, double every three years. Italy is not, uh, uh, is not uh, less in, in this uh, uh, point uh, because we have a, a great leadership in green building. For example, Italy uh, is the first um, country for a lead project registered, and Milan is uh, uh, the second for uh, um, registered project for lead certification protocols. And so this huge amount of market and activity 
and this um, strength of the chain uh, re re redefining the way of uh, design and construct building is uh, um, giving um, a huge uh, and, and a new um, incredible uh, focus um, for the uh, sustainable, sustainable uh, sector. But there is a, um, a missing link. Um, in fact, uh, exploring the potential of green building market, we asked how to merge uh, and bridge the gap between energy efficiency and environmental uh, sustainability and heritage preservation. We strongly believe that uh, we need to merge green building uh, work with the sustainable build heritage. This is the reason why in 2015, GBC Istaria defined the, the first uh, uh, in the world, uh, the first uh, green building uh, um, protocol uh, called the GBC Historic Building. GBC Historic Building is, a, is an energy environmental rating system uh, for refurbishment of historic buildings and restoration processes. Uh, it's an important step forward in the culture of green building, merging two uh, different aspects, sustainability and restoration. We say that restoration is sustainable when allows future generations to recognize the same cultural and environmental value that we can recognize today. And uh, what is an historic building for uh, our protocol? And we are fully compliant with the historic building definition. So it's a pre-industrial architecture, pre-industrial buildings, material techniques, building elements, how we can see all over in Italy and in general in Europe and the world. Uh, in this uh, regard, Italy have more than 30% of building stock related to um, building um, with this kind of feature. Um, when to use this kind of process uh, for um, restoration and sustainable restoration, we can use for all kinds of architecture um, from uh, residential to commercial institutional for detached or semi-detached buildings, aggregate buildings, uh, and for historic center, for example. And we can apply the restoration process and the green building, um, historic building protocol to restoration, rehabilitation, refurbishment, we cannot apply to demolition and reconstruction. In that case, we must use, for example, different kinds of energy and environmental protocols. GBC Story Building is, uh, um, uh, is uh, the new protocol for this kind of aspect and insert in the in, uh, area, uh, in the, in the structure of the protocol, a new area called historic value. And historic value is the focus and the most important um, aspect of the rating system. And is linked to the knowledge of the historic building uh, that is needed before design and define what we can do in the restoration process. The other areas are similar, but well defined for historic uh, building, but similar to different uh, um, uh, protocols for sustainable buildings, like sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy atmosphere um, management, materials and resources, indoor environmental quality, and last but not least, innovation in design and regional priority. This is a rating system, so it's a way we can analyze, uh, design, and realize our restoration process, and at the end, have a rating system um, in, uh, in a few words, it's a value that represents the uh, quality of our building related to the restoration and um, sustainable restoration process. Uh, there are many uh, example and case studies uh, in, in which we applied the historic building process and historic building protocol. The first was Cascina Gringo in uh, Piemonte region uh, the first certi certified building is called Scuderie della Rocca Santa Pollinare near uh, Perugia in the region Umbria. 
um, Palazzo Gulinelli in Ferrara, for example, is the first uh, um, building um, uh, used as a school, for example. And uh, we have a lot of other important, interesting um, buildings that are starting their process for the certification in restoration, like Castello Estense, Ospitale Sant'Agostino, Palazzo Santander in Torin, uh, and, uh, and so on. There are few of that buildings that have a different value, I think. For example, the Museum of Hebraism and Shoah Mace is uh, a building, um, is an interesting building, and the property is the uh, Minister of, of the um, Italian Minister of Culture. So uh, it's uh, uh, something where we started uh, our collaboration and activities with the Minister, um, and now this building is certified uh, with the protocol. Another interesting part. Um, that is starting is with Palazzo uh, Silvestre Rivaldi, is uh, an incredible building um, nearby the um, Colosseum in Rome. And uh, in Rome, we have, for example, the first church in the world applying a uh, um, historic sustainable process of reconstruction and, and um, um, reactivation of, of, of this building, and uh, is, I think it's one of the incredible examples that how can be applied in general around the world. Um, GBC Story Building Protocol now is starting an internationalization process, and this is the reason why we are very happy to present to, to all of you this kind of process, because we believe and we strongly believe that heritage and sustainability can be a, a new way and an important and um, uh, an important way to um, enhance sustainability around the world. Um, we are open to international case studies, and uh, potential applicants can uh, send us uh, um, uh, and submit specific form for um, this kind of project around the world. And we just uh, um, uh, um, defined the first uh, um, historic building international case study with Asso Restauro and the Minister, uh, the Italian Minister of Culture uh, in Cuba, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, La Habana, an impressive building in, uh, in La Habana. Uh, at the end of my speech, I think it's important, um, it's important uh, to um, uh, define um, uh, a framework of uh, agreement with, with all the institutions, and we define it one between GBC Italia, Asso Restauro, and, uh, international, and, and the Italian Minister of Culture. And the, 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 the main focus of this agreement is uh, on uh, what we believe that sustainable criteria uh, um, must be uh, related and linked to knowledge of the world of restoration. And this knowledge, uh, uh, in this knowledge, Italy holds uh, uh, rules of excellence and international, uh, on international scene. We think that uh, a strong partnership is uh, a bridge and uh, we are open to this kind of partnership. And uh, at the end, uh, I thank you for invite GBC Italia and myself, and I hope you will join us and join this big family for the internationalization process of GBC for building. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for being with us. Tomorrow morning we will meet uh, in uh, San Giuseppe dei Falegnami, still in Rome, for the fourth day of the Restoration Week 2020. Now Sonia is telling us something technical about the Zoom meeting that is ongoing. Thank you very much again. And saluti da Palazzo Rivaldi, restauro at the times of the COVID. Ciao a tutti. Uh, thank you, thank you everybody for having been with us today.
we remind you that for the registered user, uh, you can go the, to the link below here, Zoom, to meet the Italian expert of the field. Uh, they will um, present their company and their expertise about the topics that we talk about today. So go, go down below to and click to the link Zoom and see you there. Okay? Bye-bye. See you tomorrow.